Our guest speaker tonight is Dick Santo, and he practices in uh, Upper Saddle River, New Jersey, and he's been in practice since 1954. He's graduated from Chiropractic Institute of New York. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, a real on target guy, the galvanizer, the man who's going to whip us into shape tonight, Dr. Dick Santo. Yeah. Chiropractic in Connecticut is no different than chiropractic in you know, I, I There's a lot of stories about Connecticut. That Connecticut's a tough place. That uh, principal chiropractors are in an absolute minority in Connecticut. They're in an absolute minority every place. That uh, in order to practice in Connecticut and be successful, uh, you have to uh, use uh, Therapies and modalities. Uh, you'll hear that same story in every state. That uh, principal chiropractors in, in Connecticut are uh, unable to get together with each other because of distances. Well, in, in New Jersey, we have an advantage with that because New Jersey is so small that really nothing is that far away. So I can understand that being probably maybe something that's unique to the other. 49 states, with the exception of perhaps Delaware and Rhode Island, Connecticut is, is probably the third smallest state in the, in the Union. So we don't have that. I mean, I have uh, probably uh, 500 chiropractors within uh, an hour. Of a mile. A mile, let's get to a mile. Uh, so this, this whole idea of, of chiropractic in Connecticut being different or being harder or being more difficult than it is any place else, is in reality not true. Chiropractors, principal chiropractors, have always had, no matter where it's been, it's always been difficult. It's never been the easy road. It has always been the harder road to travel. Simply because you, uh, you don't fit. There is no place for you in the structure of society. The way society is structured, there's no slot for you. There's no place for you to go. There's no place that you comfortably fit. You are in reality a round peg in a square hole. Society is structured around a therapeutic mentality. Things are done to treat something. Teachers treat ignorance by using something called education. Medical physicians treat something called disease by using surgery and medicine. Psychiatrists treat the mind by using some sort of mental gymnastic, either in regression or depending on the man's therapy. But it's, it's again, it's some sort of mental gymnastic. All these things come from outside. If you take away the tools that the medical physician has, he's helpless. If you take away the books and the learning that the teacher has, she's helpless. If you take away the apparatus that the therapist has, he's helpless. The world operates on an outside-in concept. Everything that happens or changes my life, according to this theory, occurs from the outside in. I could do better if I changed my location. I could do better if I only changed my technique. I could do better if I got rid of my front girl and hired a blonde. I could do better if uh, I had gone to this school rather than that school. I could do better if I would have married somewhere else. I could do better if I would have never gotten married. I could do better if I could only get rid of my associate. I could do better if my kids weren't always in trouble. I could do better if I had studied harder in school. I could do better, I could do better, I could do better. And all the things that we consider doing better about are on the outside. And we spend a lot of money attempting to do this. 
People spend thousands of dollars changing houses, changing offices, changing techniques. People destroy relationships, getting rid of wives, getting rid of receptions. And nothing happened. Except you moved, or you have a new technique, or you have a new wife, or you have a new receptionist. But nothing inside of you changes. Nothing else You are still as unhappy as you were before you attempted to make the changes. Because what changes on the outside has absolutely nothing to do with what changes on the inside. In fact, most of what's on the outside is created by what's on the inside. If you're unhappy in a relationship, perhaps it's not the relationship. Perhaps it's how you approach the relationship. It's very difficult when you point one finger forward not to notice that there are three fingers pointing backward. It is much easier to blame failure, frustration, anger, anxiety, hysteria on something else. When in reality, all these things are created from the inside. We create them. If we create them, then we can uncreate them. We can destroy them. We can eliminate them. We can take them from our reality. And the solution is that within all of us is a spark, an ember, a particle of that common consciousness that some of us refer to as God, Others refer to as universal intelligence. Others refer to as nature. But each of us carries within us an ember, a piece, an iota of the entire whole. You and I carry embers from the same piece. You and I are the same thing in different form, in different personality. But we are, in our basic form, the same thing. You and I are the same thing. We have different form, we have different persona. But the me and the you are the same thing. This ember, this iota, this particle, has connection with the whole. And that connection, in chiropractic terminology, is referred to as innate intelligence. You do not have innate intelligence. You are innate intelligence. You are a connection through this iota with everything that has ever been, is, as ever will be. Any change you wish to make in yourself can be made by merely listening and waiting for the solution to the problem that possesses you. This flow, this innate, this intelligence that comes from above down, inside out, has been known throughout the ages no matter whose philosophy, no matter whose religious teaching, no matter whose spiritual givings from whatever personality, if you stay with them long enough, the bottom line always is, you are a child of God, you are a piece of the universe, you are a particle of consciousness. The answer is the same no matter where you look. 
I don't care what religion you are, you have heard this somewhere in your church, in your catechism class, in your Sunday school class, in your synagogue. You've heard it. You've heard it either on Sunday or Saturday or Friday night or Wednesday night or when it happened to be. And at that time, it possessed you. And you left through the door and you left the possession of that concept in the room where you were. How many in here are Catholic? Huh? Okay. Right? Baltimore Catechism? Right? Why did God make you? Right? God made you to know Him, to love Him, and to serve Him. Every Catholic in the entire world can recite that to you by rote, because we couldn't get past First Communion. And if you had Sister Angelina like I had Sister Angelina, you knew that by heart, right? Now, every religion has a variation of that, but the basic concept is the same. To know, to love, and to serve God is the purpose of man. It makes no difference. I don't care what you are. You can be Hindu, you can be naturalist, you can be Protestant, you can be Jewish, you can be anything you want, but basically somewhere in the tenets, that concept exists. And we recite that. Not only do we recite that, we swear to it. In the churches, you are asked to come forward and swear to this concept, and we swear to this concept. Yet when we leave the temple, or we leave the church, and we enter into the world, the concept stays behind. When in chiropractic tenet, when in chiropractic philosophy, we say that there is a universal intelligence, and you are the personified expression of that universal intelligence called innate intelligence. And your function as a chiropractor is to serve, to listen to, to acknowledge, and to go out into the world to make the world a better place. We balk, and we say, that's religion. It has nothing to do with chiropractic. That's religion. And on Sunday we go to know, to love, and to serve God. To know, to love, and to serve God. And on Monday we go into the office when in reality we have Opus Dei, the work of God before us, right? And we say, that's not professional. Ooh. Okay. That's not professional. That's not my job. My job, my job is to sit there and analyze your problem and to take away your pain and to charge you for that service and to wish you well and see you on Wednesday. If that's your job, in a very short period of time, you're going to count the days to retirement. You're going to put a calendar on your wall and you're going to say only 5,672 more days to be tired. And every day you'll come in and you'll check it off. You've got 5,672 days to be tired. Because what I just described to her is a job. Is a job. And if you went into chiropractic to do a job, I guarantee you we put a job But it is probably the worst job in the entire world. <laughs> to have people come into your presence and say to you things like, I don't know what you did to me last time, but since ever you did that. Huh? Or, what do you mean I have to be x-rayed? Huh? I got x-rayed in 1972. But I've got them right here. <laughs> or, uh, you, you think, Doc, that uh, we could add a couple visits to the insurance form? <laughs> That's the job. And those people that are wise in the ways of the world can utilize that and make a very good living at that job. And if that's how you want to spend your life, 
power to them. Because you will need all the power you can get. <laughs> but if you decide to use up your life, to use it up in such a way that the world is better on the day that you die because you were here, then you are learning to know, to love, and to serve God. And that brings the one thing that each and every person in this room is looking for. And that one thing is happiness. That's what everybody wants. Everybody wants to be happy. Why do you collect money? To do what? To look at it? Why do you collect money? You collect money to buy things in the hope that things will make you happy. I got a bigger car. I got a bigger house. My wife wears more jewelry. My kids have more expensive sneakers. Ha ha, we're all happy. <laughs> now those of you, those of you, and there are, and I'm sure that there, there are a number of you in this room, those of you who have made a great deal of money in your practice, right, know that it's not true. Those of you who have reached that point in your life where you've accumulated money, and accumulated wealth, know that wealth only brings with it responsibility. It does not bring with it happiness. Happiness comes only from one thing. Happiness comes from serving. You love someone very much. It's Christmas. You get more pleasure from the gift they give you, or from the gift you give them. If you bought something really special for somebody you love, you can hardly wait until they open it. The excitement is them, the joy in their face. And, I mean, the gift you get is very nice and you appreciate it, but the concept is, 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 is in the giving. This is where the joy has always been in the giving. Those of you who are parents, when you give to your children, right? I mean, where is there anything even close to that as far as joy is concerned with anything else? Right? When a kid looks up at you and says, thank you, Dad, or thank you, Mom, or looks at you and just smiles if they're not old enough even to say thank you, right? Or they come and they put their arms around you and they give you a big hug, right? You tell me about happiness. But when a kid comes home from school, right? scribbles on a card that she's made at school, right? It, I love you, Dad. That's happiness. How do you get it? You get it by giving. How do you give it? You give it by serving. How do you serve it? Those of us who were called into this profession, are extremely fortunate because we have the opportunity to do it every day. You have the opportunity to serve every single day. Now, you've heard the saying, God sent you the patient. I mean, if you've been down to DE or you've been to some seminars or been to some lectures, you say, God sends in the patients, don't worry about it. all you have to do is take care of them. I'm going to add a B part to that. Okay. Let's assume God sends in the patients. Now, I want you to imagine you're in your adjusting room. Patients on the table, you're going to adjust. Right? And you look over in the corner and God's watching. Okay. How do you adjust? Now, how do you adjust? I mean, this is not now... God's watching now. I brought this guy in. I brought you this patient in. Now, 
Do I want you? How do you do this? Concept is scary. Yet that's the responsibility of adjusting. The responsibility of adjusting is not bang, bang, thank you, ma'am, boom, see you Wednesday. It's not, I saw 150 people today. And I'm going to get seven new patients tomorrow, so we'll see that much more tomorrow. That's not the idea. The idea is knowing that when you look over in the corner of the room and God is watching and you adjust, right? That you've done exactly what you were supposed to do. And you've turned the power and light on in that patient. And in turning the power and light on in that patient, you've connected the infinite with that person's spark, that person's ember, that person's iota, so that they are now more closely connected with the universe. So that the energies that exist out there now flow through them to the maximum that they can flow. And their ability to function in the world is as good as it can be. And the technique you use to reach that point means nothing. It is only important to you, period. Whatever vehicle that you have determined in order to establish the technique, it's fine. I don't care what it is. It makes no difference. To a great degree, it depends on what your belief system is. As long as the end result is that you have made that connection, you have eliminated the interference so that that flow now comes down and exists and that person now can express themselves to the best of their ability to express themselves. So they can go into the world to do what they were put on earth to do. I have a definition, and you reminded me of it, I have a definition of subluxation. Subluxation to me is a hole through which your life seeps out. We're plumbers. We plug holes. But we're also square pegs and round holes. The effects of subluxation are enormous. The effects of subluxation are divorce, poverty, hunger, pollution, and I haven't even hit pathology. Pain, physical symptoms, body destruction, suicide, death. The outside in people, the therapist, the physician, take care of one small part of the effect of subluxation. They attempt to take that little part that has to do with pathology. Because if there is no pathology there, there's nothing they can put in from the outside. They cannot even attempt to treat the effect of subluxation until the subluxation has reached that point in its progression that there is enough destruction that some test can determine that some abnormality exists. And then they can only treat it if they have an opposite effect type of medication. This is the part they take care of on the subluxation, or they attempt to take care of on the subluxation. This is the part we take care of. If a patient comes into your office, you adjust them, you connect them. They are now connected. They are now full of knowledge. They now are able to express their innate ability. They go out now and they discover a technology that enables them to get rid of sewerage or to get rid of pollution. Has the removal of the subluxation now helped to get rid of pollution? You adjust someone who figures out some way, some way to grow crops, some way to package food, some way to transport food, the food to, to now feed the hungry. Have your adjustment now got rid of hunger? You adjust someone and they, and, they, and they create some new way, some new way of understanding so that 
people can learn easier, or some new way of doing something that makes life easier somewhere along the line, as you adjust but now improve the nature, the concern of the entire human community? Why do we limit ourselves to worrying about whether or not you've got pain, since that's that much of the substance? so narrow. We refuse to allow the real parameters to close us in. We're in this little tight wrap of cellophane and we, and, and we can't break out of it. And we allow people to talk us into making the cellophane even tighter. We pass laws among ourselves that say, let me tighten it even more. Let me restrict that part of civilization that you can take care of even tighter. I honestly believe that these lawgivers are self-extent. Otherwise, they would never do this. How many times have you adjusted a person and unbeknownst to you, they became a better parent? Are you familiar with the story that Jay Coxon tells of the man that comes to his office complaining of back pain. And he adjusts the man, and the man brings in with him his 10-year-old daughter. And after a few adjustments, Jay says to the daughter, have you noticed anything different about that? He says, he's getting adjusted. And the little girl says, yes, he doesn't beat me anymore. And we spend 99.9% .9 of our time on headaches and backaches and worrying about colds and trying to think what other people think about us and how we can improve our image. I believe with all my heart that we are in the process of evolution, not in which we are going to grow another finger or get rid of a coccyx or change hair or skin, but that we are in the beginning of an evolution that will allow man to become more human. We walk around as if we were humans in search of a spiritual experience. And in reality, we are spiritual beings in search of a human experience. The world is your practice. The entire world is your practice. What do we tell the people when they come in to see us? What do we tell them? What, what, first of all, what visual image do we give them? What do our offices look like? Do they look like the offices of people that take care of this much of the civilization? Do we suggest this to them subtly? This contact of, of I am also a physician or a doctor, knowing full well that what we're trying to get across to them is, I'm really the same as a medical doctor. Only I don't use drugs as of yet. Do people know that we're different? And we're different. You can put a hammer and try to bang that square peg in that round hole all you want, but you don't fit. You don't fit. And if you try to fit, you're going to be unhappy. And I'm sorry, that's the way it is. 
You were chosen to be here. Not to join the world, but to change the world. Those people you come in contact with will never be the same. I don't care if that person came into your office complaining about pain in the dorsal spine, came in once, you adjusted him, and you never saw him again. You changed him. You may not have changed him as much as he could have been changed, but you changed him. I would rather we stood up and all of us stood in different parts of the country and we lined the rest of the country up and we adjusted in our lifetime 300 million people at least once. We adjust, we adjust I don't know, we adjust. Chiropractors of all kinds see approximately 3% of the population. 3% of 300 million is what? In what? What do we know? 95 years? 96 years? 3% of the population? About the same time that we got started, communism got started in Russia. A bunch of, a bunch of bolts, crazy Bolsheviks running around through the country converted most of the world. That, thank God it's gone down. But they believed so fervently in their cause they went out. Do we believe that fervently in their cause? Are we that passionate about what we do? Are we really ready to take on the slings and arrows of ridicule to stand up for what we believe? I don't know. When you get up in the morning and you prepare to go into the office and you walk into your office, how do you feel? How do you feel? You have a knot in your stomach and you feel, oh boy, here we go again. You have the knot in your stomach and you say to yourself, oh boy, here we come again, or here we go again. Or you look out the waiting room and you see that woman out there that you really don't want to see. Huh? Who, by the way, is a gift. How do you feel? Anybody here read Emmett Fox? Emmett Fox wrote a little pamphlet a number of years ago called The Golden Key. And in The Golden Key, Emmett Fox said, if you want to change anyone, you can change them instantly. If you have someone in your life that aggravates you or irritates you, you can change them instantly. And the way you change them is before you come into their presence, you say to yourself, when I come into this person's presence, the only thing I will see, the only thing that I will become aware of is that little bit of them that is the essence of God. That's all I'm going to see when I come into their presence. And when you come into their presence, they've changed. I guarantee you, I've done this a hundred times. It's, they're a different person. Absolutely. No more irritation, no more nastiness. They change. You don't believe, do it tomorrow when you go, if, you, if you're working tomorrow, do it tomorrow. It'll blow your mind. You'll, 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 you'll sit down there and you'll say, if you've got nothing else from tonight, do that. And it took me a long time to realize that I didn't change them. I changed me. I changed me. If I look at you and I see only the essence of God, right? Right? I change me. When you look at your patients and you see only the essence of God and you put them on the table and you put your hand on them and you know what you're doing is connecting them to the universe and allowing innate to flow through them, right? what kind of adjustments do you think you're going to get? 
Have you ever had somebody that you find really difficult to move if you if you if the kind of adjustment you give moves bones, right? And you and you adjust like that. Have you ever had a patient, or am I the only one that gets them that every once in a while you can't move? Like, right? All right. The next time that happens, just just if you're going to thrust, right? Put your hand on the person that you're going to thrust on, right? Look down there, right? Right? And love the patient just for a second. Just go. love them, not physically or arrows. Or, just love them because they're them, right? And then thrust, and the bone will go. Try it. Do it tomorrow. Why do you suppose that is? Did you change the patient? Or did you change you? How many of you are in the office and it's getting late, and you're running behind, or whatever it is, and the patients are coming down, and you're putting them down on the table, they're on the table, and you go, boom, 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 right? And your mind is uh, uh, on, on, the, on the plane that you're going to catch at 9 o'clock to go down on DE or whatever it happens to be, and you're, and you're, and you're doing this, right? right? How many of those people got adjusted? How many of those people got adjusted? How many of them got manipulated? A whole bunch of them got manipulated. More ways than one. How many of them got adjusted? The adjustments are like <coughs> adjustments are like sex. It can either be an act of love or an act of rape. And it depends on what the circumstances and the attitude. Physical action and love and rape are exactly the same. It is the circumstance and the attitude that is different. And in your relationship to the patient, it is exactly the same thing. Boom, boom, boom is boom, 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 except for attitude and relationship. Everybody knows a practitioner into which office people flock. I mean, he could. I, there was a fellow in New Jersey by the name of, 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 of Bob, of, of Bob Bridge, Robert Bridge. He started to practice in, uh, I think it was 1920. He practiced in a town called Pompton Lakes. Pompton Lakes was just exactly the way it sounds. Right? In order to get to Pompton Lakes, you had to take an old country road for about 10 miles. And after you got off the old country road for about 10 miles, you had to get onto a dirt road that had two ruts in it. right? And you had to ride on that road for about four miles. And then when you came to the end of the cornfield, you had to turn into his driveway right, to get to his house in which his practice was. In the 1920s, in the 1920s, he used to see between 150 and 200 people a day. And if you attempted to get to him at light, at night, it would double the peril because there was no lights, no nothing. I mean, you could miss something and be, you know, they wouldn't find you for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> never advertised. Never advertised. Used to, uh, that, it was cash practice, so there was never any billing. Never, nothing even went in the mail. People found him. Now, why do you suppose that was? People found him. Do you think it was because of Bing, Bing, Bing? Or do you think it was because he had something special? And then when people came into his presence, they felt that something special. And when he put them on a the table and adjusted them, they got something special. Everybody in this room has the absolute ability to be something special. Everybody in this room has the ability to be something special. You already are something special. A lot of us have put bushels on our head 
so that nobody will know that. And I think maybe it's time we took off the bushels. I think maybe it's time to let the light shine. I think maybe it's time we went into the office for the right reason. I think maybe it's time we put our hands on people for the right reason. I think maybe it's time we stop trying to figure out how we're going to fit in the world and realize that the world has to fit with us. I think maybe it's time we understand how really large our mission is. I think maybe it's time we get the cellophane unwrapped from around us and we stand up and we go, my God, I'm free. I'm not smothering anymore. I am who I am and I don't care who knows it. I can breathe. And like the parable in the Gospels of the soil, of the, of the, of the seed soil, some of the seeds that you will sow will fall on rock and die. And some of the seeds that you sow will fall on shallow ground, take root for a while, wither and die. And some of the seed you sow will fall on fertile ground and will grow. And those people will be your patients. And don't waste time on the ones who refuse to grow. Because there are many, too many seeds in the fertile soil. If you're not seeing as many people as you think you should be seeing, if in your capacity you feel you should be serving more people, and serve more people by serving people more. Make each adjustment that you give an adjustment that comes from love. Make each time you put your hand on that person know that the purpose is to unite, to free them, to connect them. And when you do that, then your space will be filled. And when you look over in the corner, God will be smiling. The innate in me blesses the innate in you.